everyone. Um, so I'm here to introduce our lovely authors. Um, Shamile Said Mendez is a football obsessed Argentine American who loves meteor showers, summer, astrology, and pizza. She lives in Utah with her Puerto Rican husband and their five kids, two adopt adorable dogs and one majestic cat. An inaugural Walter Dean Myers grant recipient, she's a graduate of Voice Voices of Our Nation and the MFA program in writing for children and young adults at Vermont College of Fine Arts. Mendez is also part of Las Musas, the first collective of women and non-binary Latinx middle grade and young adult authors. Furia is her first novel for young adult readers. And in conversation with her is Jaquira Diaz, who was born in Puerto Rico. Her work has been published in Rolling Stones, The Guardian, Long Reads, The Fader, and the New York Times Style Magazine, uh, and included in the Best American Essays in 2016. She is a recipient of the 2020 Whitting Award for Emerging Writers, two Pushcart Prizes, and an Elizabeth George Foundation Grant, and a fellowship from McDowell Col Colony and Kenyon Review and the Wis uh, Wisconsin Institute of Creative Writing. She lives in Miami Beach with her partner and writer Lars Horn. Thank you so much both for coming. Um, I love these books. I'm so excited that we have you both here. So I'm going to pass it on to you both. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, so hi, it's nice to see you all here. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I am so excited to talk about Furia today, and we are here with Shamile. This is such, I want to say, an incredible book. I feel like this book had so much that, that I loved, like things that I needed as a teen, as a kid, you know, who loved books, who wanted to see just strong feminist characters. Um, and I want to commend you for writing it. One of the one of the things that stood out for me right like right on was how strong Camila's character was and how determined she was to succeed on her own terms. Um, I maybe I guess I if we could open with you reading some of your favorite passages or if you have a passage that you'd like to read so that um, those who who are joining us can hear a little bit of. Um, Camila's voice and um, maybe her furia. <laughs> yes, excellent. Thank you so much, Akira. I'm so honored to be here today. I've been a fan of your work for a long time. I love that we have that Puerto Rico connection and, <laughs> and uh, the Arabic sounding first names. I feel like, uh, like I know you. So thank you <laughs> for um, joining me in this virtual tour of furia. And like you said, Furia, for those of you who don't know, is a story about Camila Hassan, a girl who lives in Rosario, Argentina, which happens to be my hometown, and the place where I was born and raised until I came to the United States to go to school. And she has the dream of being, uh, to be a professional soccer player, what we call football in Argentina, and pretty much everywhere else in the world. Uh, but the problem is that she, um, this is not a path that's available to her because of different things. Although there are teams, the, the, the dream of becoming professional is pretty far-fetched for a girl and not for a boy. Rosario is uh, known uh, for the amazing soccer players that we export all over the world. Players like Leo Messi and Angel Di Maria. I mean, these are names that are still contemporary current uh, soccer stars but all of them are men and we never hear about the girls so when i set out to write about the things that were in my heart uh, camila came to me fully formed because she just made up of the thousands of girls that i've met throughout the years and the little girl that i once was that had also all, uh, this love for soccer but uh, but i couldn't even even play so I would like to share a little bit of the first chapter with you. And it starts like this. Lice have short legs. I learned this proverb before I could speak. I never knew exactly where it came from. Maybe the saying followed my family across the Atlantic all the way to Rosario, 
the second largest city in Argentina at the end of the world. My Russian great-grandmother, Isabel, embroidered it on a pillow after her first love broke her heart and married her sister. My Palestinian grandfather, Ahmed, whispered it to me every time my mom found his hidden stash of wine bottles. My Andalusian grandmother, Elena, repeated it like a mantra until her memories and regrets called her to the next life. Maybe it came from Matilde, the woman who chased freedom to Las Pampas all the way from Brazil. But of her, this black woman whose blood roared in my veins, we hardly ever spoke. Her last name got lost, but my grandma's grandma still showed up so many generations later in the way my brown hair curled, the shape of my nose, and my stubbornness. Ay Dios mío, my stubbornness. Like her, if family folklore was to be trusted, I had never learned to shut up or do as I was told. But perhaps the word sprouted from this land that the conquistadores thought was encrusted with silver, the only inheritance I'd ever received from the indigenous branch of my family tree. In any case, when my mom said them to me as I was getting ready to leave the house that afternoon, I brushed her off. I'm not lying, I insisted, fighting with the tangled laces of my sneakers, real Nikes that Pablo, my brother, had given me for Christmas after he got his first footballer paycheck. I told you, I'll be at Roxana's. My mom put down her sewing, a sequin skirt for a quinceanera, and stared at me. Be back by seven, the whole family will be over to celebrate the season opener. The whole family, as if. For all their talk about family unity, my parents weren't on speaking terms with any of their siblings or cousins. But my dad's friends and Pablo's girlfriend would be here eating and gossiping and laughing until who knew when. You know Pablo, ma? I'm sure he has plans for the team. He specifically asked me to make pizzas, she said with a smirk. Now you be on time and don't do anything stupid. Stupid like what? My words came out too harsh, but I had stellar grades. I didn't do drugs. I didn't sleep around. Hell, I was 17 and not pregnant. Unlike every other woman in my family, you would have thought she'd give me some credit, be on my side, but, but no, nothing I did was enough. I was not enough. It's not like I can go to a gigante. I don't have money for a ticket. She flung the fabric aside. Mira, Camila. How many times have I told you that a football stadium no place for a decent senorita? That girl who turned up in a ditch, if she hadn't been hanging out with the wrong crowd, she'd still be alive. There was a little bit of truth in what she said, but just a little. That girl, Jimena Marquez, had gone missing after a game last year, but she had been killed by her boyfriend, El Paco. He and Pope Francisco shared a name, but El Paco was no saint. Everyone knew that. Just as everyone knew, he used every woman in his life as a punching bag, starting with his mother. If I pointed this out though, my mom would start ranting about the new Namenos movement, how it was all feminist propaganda, and I'd miss my bus. My championship game, the one my mom couldn't know about, was at four, the same time as Central's league opener. At least they were at opposite ends of the city. And that's it for, for now. Thank you. Um, so that's such a great opening when you open with a proverb, lies have short legs, mm -hmm. which is a kind of ominous introduction to what will happen in the novel. Yeah. Um, we start with uh, Camila keeping secrets from her family, her mom, her dad. Can you talk a little bit about that lie and why it was necessary? for Camila to keep this part of her life a secret? Because she felt like if um, the whole family is keeping secrets from each other uh, mm. extent, and the greatest lie of, of all, and which she will discover throughout the story, is that girls cannot have it all. And she realizes that the women in her family have believed this forever, that in order to be happy, they have to either, cho either choose between the love of their lives, who turn out never to be the love of their lives or something good for them, or their dreams. 
that they always have to be chasing after somebody's dream. And this somebody is usually the man of the family, either the father or, or a spouse or a partner. And every woman in her family has been living this cycle of abandoning herself for the, the beliefs and the dreams of others. And up until her, every woman in her, in her family had believed this, but she doesn't anymore. She realizes that's a lie. The only problem is that she doesn't know how to do both. She doesn't know how to follow her dreams and at the same time, perhaps give love a chance because there is the love interest in the book who is a good person and it's somebody that she really loves and who really loves her back. But if she, she thinks that if she chooses life with him, she'll be betraying her dreams, just like every other woman in her life has done. So, and also another lie that she tells herself is that she kind of has to atone for all and fix all the mistakes that were done by every other person in her family before she came along. So she takes all this responsibility on her shoulders. Mm. And then one by one, these lies come to, to light. The lies that she's telling people and the lies that society tells girls. Um, another point that I usually make is that Sometimes society will tell girls and women, particularly, that we can do it all, right? Mm. Uh, but then in practice, we get the opposite message. And so Camila also reveals uh, that, that lie. Also the lie that there's danger outside the home. Uh, Camila lives in a society that's been fighting with the ghost and the specter of violence against women and, and girls particularly and uh, which has been endemic, not only in Argentina, but throughout Latin America. And the Nuna Menos movement has been uh, the voice pretty much on the, the engine trying to bring attention to that. So the other lie that she tries to reveal and that she discovers is that sometimes you are safe home. So for Camila, it's the complete opposite. Her greatest danger lives inside her house. Mm. And that until she doesn't, speak up about the problems with her mother and the mother doesn't also reveal her own problems. They cannot be safe from this danger. So there's lies all over. And um, it's not like the, the, the characters are just keeping this secret from each other because they want to do it out of spite. It's just that they don't know any other way of living their lives. They're just repeating things that have been done for generations. So this is, this is her breaking those patterns. Um, yeah, I, it's interesting that that she has um, in in it's a very clear. There's a very clear danger that lives outside, and that you mentioned that for her, one of the most dangerous is actually living inside her home. Um, I was thinking of that moment, that first moment that we get with her father, when you really see that what her father actually expects of her. Mm -hmm. and what he's asking her to sacrifice and I mean I don't want to you know spoil too much for the readers for those who haven't read it yet but there's a moment a very clear moment that it feels like he is saying to her I deserve these things I deserve to have everything that Diego has I deserve the fame because I'm a man and it's your job to get it for me or and he says you know for us for the family but really he wants it for himself. He wants all these things for himself. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know, I mean, I don't want to spoil it for, for the readers, but I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about Camila and her father's difficult relationship and maybe why you felt it was important to portray these characters this way. Well, I feel like in a, in a certain extent, the family is a microcosmos of what's going on in the society around her. So, among all my characters, the father is the most one-dimensional one because he's seen from her point of view, from her perspective. We mm. see glimpses of who he was before. Because, and, and there's a, a scene in which the mother says, oh, my mom loved him. She, she, she adored him. Uh, but Camila has never seen that charming side of her father, although he does put a mask when he's in front of other people. He also has a lot of lies that he's hiding. And, 
And so he's my most one dimensional character uh, on purpose because he's just the personification of patriarchy and the toxicity mm -hmm. in patriarchy that doesn't only affect the girls and women and, and children in our societies, but it also really hurt the boys and who will become men. We see it in the example of the brother who, and Camila, because of course they grew up together and she has all these memories of, of them being children. She knows he has a tender heart, but he's just repeating again the same patterns. And if he continues on this path that he's going, he's going to end up just like the father that he hates so much. And, and, and so that's why uh, they're portrayed in this way. When I started writing Furia, I thought that the story had to do more with Camila's relationship with her father. And then as I, as the years went by, I've been working on this uh, draft in, in, in different iterations and even titles for since 2006, more or less. Uh, as I grew as a person and as a woman and as a writer, I realized that the story really had to do with Camila's relationship with her mother. Mm. Because at the beginning of the story, Camila is very set on not becoming her mom. And then she starts realizing that the mom, although she made big mistakes in her life, she did the best that she could with the cards that were dealt to her by society and circumstances. And Camila gained a little more compassion for her mother um, because she realized that maybe under the same circumstances, she wouldn't have been the same girl that she is now, the character that we meet. And so she recognizes that the strength that she has, she inherited from her mom and she becomes a little less judgmental. And they do become a team because Camila couldn't have achieved what she did at the end of the book without her mom's support and help. So Camila's liberation story and victory is really just the continuation of the mom's journey um, in a certain way. Um, it's so interesting that that you say that because when I when I started the book, it felt it definitely felt like it was going to be more a book about her confrontation or, or her relationship with her father and being at odds with the father, much more than it was a mother daughter story. And then that became true. It was like a complete turn, and it de definitely does feel like um what she has in the end is an ally in her mother but also like their relationship has grown um one of the things that i i was thinking about a lot when i was writing my book because my book um ordinary girls has a lot um it's a memoir but it's a lot about mothers and daughters and about girls in general and my relationship to girls um is how much i avoided writing the mother daughter story for so long until I realized this, this is a book about, you know, girlhood, but also about my relationship with my mother. Um, and I think part of that was patriarchy teaches us kind of to ignore this, ignore um, who we are, what we want, whether it's desire, whether it's, in, you know, intimacy, all these things that make us stronger. <laughs> And for so long, like I had to stop thinking about what was expected of me and write the story I wanted to write. And I, I'm often asked about why I didn't really include more about love, like romantic love in my book. And to me, it feels like my book is a love story, but it's really about the love between a mother, a daughter and a girl and her friends, right? Like those are, that's yeah. a love story. <laughs> Um, yes. And for me, the, the love story in Furia is much more about a girl who learns to love herself more um, mm -hmm. and loves herself more and chooses herself over any other love um, yes. um, in a way. And, and that's okay um, exactly. to choose yourself. <laughs> yes, which is such a revolutionary <laughs> because we're always told to abandon ourselves and put ourselves second or even last. And that's what the other women in Camila's life had done until a woman who, who has chosen herself comes along and shows her there is another way. And I, feel, I felt that was very important to show that um, 
not that you know that you go into the story wanting to teach your readers anything but as i started thinking more about the themes and then i get to have these opportunities to talk about the deep themes of the book i realized that for camila if she hadn't met her coach if she hadn't had the sisterhood of her teammates she wouldn't have understood that the, the power that she really had, that she didn't need anybody to rescue her from either her situation in her home or her, her situation in, in society at large, that she only needs to trust and love herself, which is so hard. And also I wanted to show um, um, how revolutionary for a brown skinned girl of mixed heritage, is to, to love herself when all the messages that she gets in the media or even in society with the example of the brother's girlfriend being more sought after or more liked because she, she fits a certain standard of beauty and Camila is the complete opposite, but Camila still loves herself. She likes, she has no problems with her self-esteem. And so I feel like uh, it's important for readers to see uh, this kind of character because if we don't see them we don't know that we can become them absolutely <laughs> absolutely like i said it, it i would have loved to have this book when i was a teenager um and, and even you know a young girl in my 20s who just loved to read a young woman in my 20s who loved to read who was looking for examples of strong characters um strong female characters but but they just weren't around and it felt like when, whenever a character had choices a woman a girl a teenage girl young woman whenever her, her she had choices they were always you know between two boys between two men and i'm like not you know i'm all i'm gay i don't want to choose between two men but also why does that have to be the choice <laughs> um so thank you. Um, we have a question in the Q&A and I just wanted to remind you all that if you wanted to ask um, Shamile a question, feel free to put it in the Q&A. Um, there's oh, a very good question from Sonia Adams. What authors and texts have influenced your craft? Oh my goodness, I, I have so many authors that I have. I, I've always been a, a voracious reader ever since I was a little girl. And growing up, we didn't have a lot of books in my family, but my mom's best friend had an extensive library. So I read everything that she had. And my mom um, was a progressive mother in the way that she never censored what I was reading. And she was just happy that I was entertained. I'm the oldest of four, and in our family, we're very close in age. And she was just, I guess, overwhelmed by all these little kids in a uh, that she had to take care of. And she also worked full time all my life. So she was just happy that I could entertain myself reading stories. <laughs> so of course, and Argentine literature is just so rich and Latin American literature at large. And so I was fortunate enough that I read Borges and Cortázar and Marquez from a very early age. And these are all authors that are also known in the US, but also authors that pretty much nobody else knows that of Latin America. Maria Elena Walsh, she was this amazing uh, writer of uh, children's literature. Alma Maritano was another author from my hometown who wrote about everyday life in a way that made it so appealing because it was like I was spying into my neighbor's homes. And she wrote about these children trying to grow in a very brand new democracy after a war with Great Britain in 82 and the dictatorship and how our society was trying to get over the dictatorship and how it affected us collectively in a way that was accessible to, to a young child to understand. Uh, and now that I'm, as an adult, I'm able to look back and, and, and recognize the ways in which uh, this catastrophic events that happened to my country affected people individually. I was born in, in, at the end of the 70s, right at the cusp of the dictatorship, mm -hmm. and of course, the event uh, affected society and my family and, and me personally uh, very strongly. Um, other writers, um, um, Isabel Allende, with I just love the way that she, she wrote about a similar event in Chile with their dictatorship and having to, to flee her country. And although I didn't flee out of persecution, 
in Argentina, we had such a terrible um, recession and uh, economic crisis that the, the most feasible way for me to get an education was to go uh, and study in the United States. So although I didn't have people in my family that, uh, um, that had emigrated from their countries, I gained this perspective from the writers that I loved, like Isabel and Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who also lived in exile in Mexico for a long time. And although my exile was voluntary, I mean, when you miss home, the heart really doesn't understand why you just miss your home um, all the same. So these are the, the authors that made me. Also, Jose Mauro de Vasconcelos was a Brazilian author who wrote again about characters in Brazilian society that are not the ones that we see in TV or like movies or telenovelas. He wrote about everyday people from the favelas and the, um, and the Amazonas. And I guess that's why I like to write about groups from, even if I'm writing a book set in Argentina, it's a group that we have not seen portrayed in our mainstream, mainstream media very often. So definitely everything that I write has echoes of all these works from these artists that I read when I was growing up. What about you? Um, I have, I have so many. Um, I'm, I'm just, trying to keep a mental list of everyone that you mentioned. Okay. Um, so my, one of my earliest experiences of reading was reading poetry because my dad read poetry. He was a poet and read a lot of Puerto Rican po protest poets. Mm -hmm. um, and my, I learned to read with my father's books, reading um, Hugo Margenat um, and reading Juan Antonio Correger and Julia de Burgos. And I wanted to be a poet so bad I was a wannabe poet and just could not write poetry. Um, and then, I mean, I started reading other things. I attempted, I tried to read, Gabriel Garcia Marquez was my father's favorite writer. And so I tried to read A Hundred Years of Solitude, Cien Años de Soledad in Spanish. Uh -huh. And, you know, I was a kid pretending I understood what was happening. Like, why is she flying away? <laughs> <laughs> why? I have no idea. And Never then, you know, <laughs> And why are there so many naked women in these pages? And then I read, or tried to read, um, El Beso de la Mujer Araña, Manuel Puig's. <laughs> and also I was like, I don't understand what's happening. Um, I thought it was gonna be about, you know, Spider-Woman. Um, <laughs> you know, I imagined a superhero. And then years later, you know, went back and read them and was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> my father was actually way ahead of his time. And, yeah. you know, but those were some of my earliest experiences reading. Um, but when I first really saw myself, someone like me in a book, it was reading Esmeralda Santiago's when I was Puerto Rican. And I thought we exist in, you know, American publishing and in, in books in English. And there, she's writing about an experience kind of like mine about a girl who's Puerto Rican. And this is just about an ordinary life. Um, and that for me was life changing. It, it felt like I had permission to write about ordinary people that I knew, people who lived in El Caserio, who, you know, who grew up in poverty or lived, were from working class families and, you know, worked every day and were raising, you know, families. And it felt very much like it was okay. Like you didn't have to be rich and white and, yeah to be in a book to exist in a literary world and so I I that felt to me like I had permission but also like I I realized how I how much I had been searching for that how I'd spent so much of my reading life reading books about people who were not like me but also th that felt like they weren't written with me in mind um as a reader they felt very much like they didn't need me as a reader and didn't care for me as a reader so i never felt cared for until i read that book and realized that i wanted you know others to have that experience to write books about people like me about people who grew up in un caserio who lived in poverty who still lived meaningful lives yes. um and that's that's what you know that was my experience um one of the things something that you mentioned, I wanted to shift gears a little bit 
um, because you mentioned uh, how how much um, writing about reading Argentinian Argentine authors shaped you. I want to talk a little bit about um, football and Argentina. Um, one of the things that I noticed is that Argentina features so prominently in the book in a way that's complicated and real and honest, but also so generous and full of love at the same time. And it felt very much like you were writing about your Argentina. So I thought, maybe, can you tell us a little bit about your Argentina? Well, it's, it's funny that you asked because uh, trying to answer some of the, uh, some interview questions that I get, and I'm sure you, you've been doing the same thing promoting your book. Sometimes you get asked the same questions over and over, but I, but in one of these interviews, there was a very different question that was, what do you miss about Argentina? Mm. Whenever I sit down, I'm like, I miss everything. I do love my life in Utah. I, I have a happy life. But I was in Argentina and in Rosario, particularly last November, and I took my youngest child along with me. And then my husband joined us later on during the trip. And he told me, you come alive. Like I'm, I'm, I'm an optimistic and generally positive person, but I just felt at home. I feel like this plant that, yes, can thrive and can bloom somewhere else, but in its land and its dirt is when it can really flourish. My husband has this, a similar experience with Puerto Rico. Sometimes he's like, I'm like El Coqui, the island's calling me and he it's island time. And that's how I feel with Argentina. So I miss uh, the Argentina that I wanted to show is the one, you know, when you're growing in a place, sometimes it's kind of hard to see the negative things or the positive things about it. And I didn't want to portray Argentina as this horrible place that nobody would ever want to visit. Because the problems that Camila sees are no different than the problems that exist in other big cities, not only in Latin America, but even in the US, because violence, uh, against women and disappeared girls is not only a monopoly of Latin America. Oh, uh, it, all, it also happens sadly here in the United States and in other developed countries of the world. But I couldn't talk about her reality if I didn't mention these monsters that are lurking behind the shadows of her world. At the same time, there are so many things to love about the city. I just uh, the river, that's really, Rosario people are people of the river. Everything revolves around it. So when Diego comes back to Rosario, naturally that's the first place that he wants to come and visit because it's really what nourishes the city. And Rosario was never founded. It just evolved naturally from immigrants that were coming from all over the world and railroad workers who brought football in the late 1800s. And all of a sudden there was this this enormous town um, and although we're only four hours away from Buenos Aires it's very different from the capital and we do speak a different way so sometimes I get offended when people say oh you don't sound like an Argentine like, I don't sound like a person from Buenos Aires but I am very much an Argentine and my accent is still very much Argentinian um, but also I wanted to show um, just the beauty in everyday tiny things like the jacarandas blooming in, in November and strawberries in October. And I, although I've lived outside of Argentina more than half of my life, I feel like the older I get, my biological clock has a harder time understanding the difference in seasons, especially for the equinox times like right now, mm. like in March and September, I never know where I am or what season it's supposed to be. I feel like we're in March right now because we're switching into fall weather and in, in the South America, fall starts in March. And so I just miss simple things that sometimes hit me with the force, but I feel, um, and there are some things that I, from home that I cannot find here in the United States. I have a lot of friends from Argentina, my best friend is from Rosario. We've known each other since we were 15 and she lives minutes from my house. But it's just stepping into the street and hearing your language and mm. hearing the sound of the birds of the place where you were born and the smell of coffee in the morning and those little things. So for a long time that I couldn't visit home for 
different reasons and I started working on this story, I feel like I was just so homesick, literally, that I tried to pour all the things that I loved about my country um, in the story. And at the same time, I couldn't do it and show it through rose-colored glasses and pretend the negative aspect didn't exist. Because the way I remember Argentina is pretty much from a point of view very similar to Camila's from a dark skinned girl from a working class family in, a, in, in government housing. So our version of Caserios is mm. Fondo, it's Fondo Nacional de Vivienda. So it's government housing. So that, that was my memory. And even though it was a hard life, uh, it was my life. And, and so I missed it so much that I, and I do think that that seeped into the words. I, it definitely did. I was feeling nostalgic. For, it was like, wait, I'm not from Argentina. I've never been there. Why am I feeling this? I'm like, I totally got what Diego, what he was missing. Like, I, I felt that in the book. Um, I often feel that for Puerto Rico, but specifically my little piece of Puerto Rico, which is very close to the beach, um, and the Puerto Rican accent. Yeah. My, Goodness, it yeah. will undo me. It will shatter me when I land and I hear people speaking un español bien jíbaro. I'm like, <laughs> I'm home. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, we have a couple, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, here's a fun one from Sharon Vélez Diodonet. What music artist would be on Camila's playlist? Well, this is a fun one because I've listened to so much music while I was working. And keep in mind, I started this book in 2006. So a lot of the music that I, that was in my, my original playlist, they're all this now. A, a lot of the music that, that inspired uh, Furia uh, were songs that were popular in the late 90s, early 2000s when I was a teenager. And so, uh, and which are terribly outdated right now. But in Camila's care, like a, 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 a today 70 year old girl, like everybody else in the world, she would be listening to Bad Bunny. And that's what it, what's in her playlist. And I just love the power of Puerto Rican reggaeton, how it has really conquered the whole world because she she definitely listens to, to San Benito. <laughs> and, and she has also La Santa Cecilia, which is a group uh, of women and their music is so empowering and, and raw and um, I never know how to say her name, but she's from Colombia, Mon Laparte, and she would have Maluma just because she's pretty to look at. <laughs> and she does have a poster of Maluma in her room after all. <laughs> and she have a lot of music from Ariana Grande and lyrics that like seven rings that she, whatever she wants she can get it for herself just, <laughs> those are some things that, some songs that she would listen to and repeat that's such a great playlist um a very quick question from someone that was in the chat um do we both plan on having our books translated into spanish um the spanish translation of ordinary girls um is called Muchachas Ordinarias and it's coming out in March from HarperCollins Español. Um, Shamile, have you heard? I know there are things in the works uh, that nothing is set in stone yet, but the, the, the demand has been so overwhelming that I think things are happening. So I can't say for sure, but hopefully soon we'll have out in Spanish as well. Um, I can't wait. I am looking forward to reading a Spanish version and also gifting it to all my family. Yes. Um, I have a lot of girl, women and girls in my family and all my, my friends all have girls and they all read and they're constantly asking me um, about what books I recommend. Uh, one, we have time for one more question. Um, Actually, we answered that question yeah. um, uh, from Alison Carey. What motivated you? What motivated you to write a book about football? Well, football is pretty much more than a religion in Argentine society. I, I I had a very deep conversation, like at four in the morning, with my my friends who are guys, 
that when we grew up together in our in our neighborhood and one of them was saying that when he meets women the question the main question at this time in his life is what team do you support because he can deal with different religion different political party but not with a different team so that's how extreme it is and so um just because i couldn't play when i was young i created my virtual reality and also subverting this stereotype of the Argentine obsessed with football is usually a man. And football in, in our society has been equated with masculinity. So Camila is just reclaiming her power over the sport. That's called beautiful. And it's called like ballet eh, on, on a pitch. So she's just trying to, to eh, put that stereotype upside down. That was my, that was my motivation. Thank you. That's so. That's such a great note to end on. Actually, um, I love it. Thank you, so <laughs> um, thank you, and thank you all for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them today. Um, however, if you if there's a link somewhere, um, I hope that you all go out and get Furia today. Order it from your indie bookstore, from Word Up Community Bookstore. Um, let's help our indie bookstores out. Let's keep them working, even though they're not um, there today in person. There's there are links. If you go up to the the top of the chat, there's um, links, and you can actually order the book online. And thank you so much. I'm honored to share this space with you today. And I hope we get to cross paths in the real world whenever that is possible when they soon, hopefully. Oh, thank you so much. It's been so fun talking about Furia and so fun to read. So much fun to read. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. And thank you all for coming and for being here. Yes. Take care you. and stay safe. Yes. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye bye. Good night.